It is 11 o'clock on Thursday, folks, downtown Honolulu. Ted Ralston here in our Think Tech studios uh, overlooking Honolulu. Uh, we have Jonathan Ruprich on with us uh, from the complete other side of the U.S. time zone, about as far as you can get away from us six hours earlier in West Palm Beach, Florida. Welcome on board our show, Where the Drone Leads, Jonathan. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I truly appreciate this opportunity. That's great. And it's great to have you on the show. And the words, rules of the show are once you're on once, you get to come back a lot. And if you really like it, you can buy the thing. In fact, I'll even negotiate the price for you on the, on the show. But anyway, uh, we're where the drone leads, and we talk about subjects that are associated and important in the emerging world of drones, especially as they apply here in Hawaii and the Pacific. Uh, we are somewhat unique in certain of our circumstances, but uh, we bring people on like you who have great knowledge and insight, and uh, really thank you for coming on. We, because it is a show about drones, we have one on the table here. We always have to have our, uh, our place setting and, and table decoration uh, properly uh, in the world of drones. This is an Instant Eye Gen 4 uh, out of PSI in Boston, Massachusetts. In any case, um, the, the world we're facing is one of needing great information and education in clear form about this whole emerging drone world. And you represent a really interesting part of this, the drone and aviation law. And if I can advertise for you, and we have to give people information about how to get a hold of you. I have to pull up uh, Jonathan's website and phone numbers and things like that, uh, Ray. But uh, you come yep. at this from an aviation and aeronautics mindset which is really unusual. It seems to me most people are entering this business from the video game or the cell phone or the RC airplane domain. And having that knowledge of the true aeronautics domain, what people are thinking about when they're in a cockpit entering uh, an airport uh, control area, something like that, is really not important information to guide our future of guidance. So tell us about your, your company, tell us about what you do, and. Tell us about how you can help with this large-scale need for education. Sure. Uh, what I can help people with is primarily dealing with the FAA. So it kind of in, in short, uh, help people get a piece of paper with their name on it, with the FAA's uh, name on it as well, saying that you can do XYZ operations. That's probably the easiest way to uh, understand it. So uh, helping people with night, wa uh, night waivers or authorizations to fly near airports, stuff like that, or just general understanding of the potential uh, risks that are out there liability-wise for uh, the drone operators as well as companies that hire the drone operators because there's liability all over the place. Uh, and so that's primarily what I do and how I help people. And um, it would, it's, I guess, in regards to uh, helping businesses going forward, um, I, I think that anybody operating in this area needs to realize that this is a uh, East Coast business. Okay, it's it's out of D.C., not Silicon Valley. So there's a lot of people in the drone industry that have that Silicon Valley mindset where if you truck a lot of technology at the problem that they think it'll go away in reality it's a legal industry it's, it's heavily regulated the quicker you learn that the better off your business will be uh, position yourself for the future you know there's a couple aspects to the nation uh, the notion of business there's also the whole public aircraft ops side which is more in the world of public safety law enforcement and public service areas and so they're business-like in that they're structured by a business, but they don't have the same uh, uh, goals and objectives as such. So certainly we find here in Hawaii that uh, the uh, Department of Land and Natural Resources, uh, police departments, fire departments, they're struggling the same way that the companies are to figure out exactly what that pathway forward is. Uh, you could help us in that area too, I suspect. Well, right, the, there, there, there's definitely a need um there and uh, I'm not exactly sure as to what the reasons are because every situation is different as to why they're having a difficulty uh, in actually implementing drone operations. I mean, the public sector has been doing drone operations for like decades, uh, you know, from the military, and then it has also progressed into you know federal agencies and down into the state agencies. 
and they have the ability to operate as public aircraft under a public COA. They can obtain a Section 333 exemption. They also have the ability to fly under Part 107. So they have a lot of uh, tools in their tool belt to accomplish the tasks at hand. So that's actually they have the most options out of, um, out of everyone. Right, and what we have to do is uh, associate the emerging technology of drones with the incident command system and the other frameworks of operation that exist and find where the attachment point is, find where the gaps need to be filled by information or training or something, and then find where any legislative limitations we have uh, have to be understood and converted into bills and then taken forward. One of the factors out here that is uh, a major concern is the, is the, what you might call the nuisance factor of the people who simply don't know what the regulations are. We have the Waikiki Beach lined with hotels and a lot of people show up from different parts of the world that bring their drone with them and then go want to operate in an area that is actually occupied also by the helicopter traffic uh, uh, corridor going out of Honolulu Airport. So we have drones and manned helicopters in the same space, they kind of don't know each other's there. So we have this need to somehow pull this into an understandable form and then pass it around and, and have people debate it and understand it. Uh, coming from, a, again, bringing an aeronautics perspective into the picture, and I like the way you put it, that this is a Washington, D.C.-centric thing, but it's dealing with a lot of pressure from Silicon Valley. So uh, a lot of social issues here, Jonathan, that you have to cross, and uh, you're sitting in the middle of all this with the, the, the proper paperwork that has to occur. Uh, well, yeah, and then there, there's a lot of inter a lot of people that are playing in the area that are all influencing it in some way or another. So you have the federal government, the FAA, putting out regulations as well as policy, and then in addition to that, you have the states that have come in and have started trying to regulate this area. Some uh, put out helpful uh, statutes as well as other ones have put out not so helpful. So um, that's further cause some problems because then it becomes very difficult when you want to fly to another state and because you're, you're pretty much everybody has at least four levels of uh, government over them at any given time. You have the federal government, the state government, a county, your city or town, and then you have to comply with all of those. It gets difficult because you have to line up. If almost think of it like tire swings and you're trying to throw a football between all four of them, it's kind of hard to be profitable uh, when you have to do that for every flight. And so um, there's going to be an big need there going forward trying to answer what is the federal government's domain and what is preempted um, by the federal government in regards to the state laws because it's becoming very difficult to try to actually scout out uh, what what are the terms people are using in that particular state, that county, that town for this thing we call a drone. Do they use the term drone? Some do, some don't. Some call it model craft over there in Hawaii. I was like, model craft? Who uses this term? You're like, <laughs> but uh, some poor unsuspecting person is going to be flying in the wrong place at the wrong time. And some uh, park, you know, recreation guy is going to come up and be like, hey, did you know about the model craft, you know, ordinance? And people are going to be like, not really. Uh, maybe it would have helped if you used the word drone because everyone else in the world uses that, <laughs> especially overseas. You know, because each and every country has a different term to uh, have remotely piloted aircraft. Um, and so, rem you know, remotely piloted aircraft system, RPAS. And then, so you have a bunch of them. Um, drone seems to be somewhat ubiquitous between everybody. Everyone kind of understands it. it's like the Coca Cola kind of terminology. It's like, we know what you mean. Okay, and so you face these uh, multi-dimensional problems all the time, but you got to sort through and end up with some structured response that conforms to the various rules of laws, or in your case, challenge the laws, as the case may be. And I, I do want to thank you for the uh, what you do to benefit all of us uh, through your information service, which is probably non-billable hours, I would guess, uh, coming <laughs> in your domain. But I think people benefit from all of that, the work you circulate. In fact, as you were beginning to touch on it here, but coming together with some standard, at least throughout the United States, commonly understood terminology and approach to the laws and such, uh, you published the recently the list of all the rules that exist in all the states. And uh, some are making a lot of sense, it seems to me. Arizona, 
and it looks like just like Florida's law in terms of the setback requirements and the uh, non uh, uh, non-risking aspects and the, the, the safety aspects, there, there seems to be a sense of commonalization coming forward. Do you see that as well? Uh, yes. Uh, and um, there, there's, uh, on, on my website, I actually have some resources that are listed there. One of them by the, um, I forgot, Amanda Essex is the publisher of it. She, uh, I'm trying to remember what organization she is with. But she published a survey of the state laws around the country, and it's helpful to kind of like read through those, even the previous ones. You can kind of see an overall trend. So like back in 2013, the laws were originally kind of addressing state use of the drones because they're um, they were afraid that drones would be used for like persistent surveillance and invasion of privacy you know fourth amendment type of stuff and then as time went on it kind of like spilled over into well let's go after the uh, the civilians as well and then it kind of morphed from um uh, you know don't fly in a careless reckless manner to spilling over into hey stay away from critical infrastructure stay away from this and then some are trying to actually get a little um Unconstitutional is probably the best way to put it, and you know, like North Carolina and others, where hey, now you have to have our state registration and our state uh, drone license, drone permit, whatever they want to call it. So they're dancing around this this uh, area that has been traditionally held to be field preempted under case law, and so this this is a big problem coming up of of who can control the lower portions of the sky. And are there certain areas of the law they can and cannot? Because traditionally, the state powers can regulate to protect the health, safety, and welfare of their citizenry. And the sky is primarily put in the national, uh, actually in the federal jurisdiction of, from the Federal Aviation Act 1958. So how does that work in regards to people trying to use drones to violate people's privacy? Well, who do we prosecute them under? Can you know preemption be a defense? I mean, that's that's one issue there. But the states have not just gone into that area where it's traditional kind of criminal laws. I mean, they already have the criminal laws on the book. They could just charge them anyway. They've gone one step further, and hey, now we're actually going to start regulating what you do in the sky and coming up with all sorts of creative cat and mouse games with, oh, well, we can't touch you in the sky, but we'll get you from where you can take off and land. And then it's like, oh, great, now I have to find a place that you don't control to then like launch it, to take my pictures, to then come back. And it's so... It's becoming a, 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 a big problem here. It's a patchwork of laws that overall hinders uh, business. And it, I mean, going back to the city of Burbank case back in 1973, the U.S. Supreme Court was discussing that in regards to noise ordinances that were created, um, specifically that the, the case had a noise ordinance in the city of Burbank, California, that prohibited aircraft from taking off. Uh, it was 11 p.m., and it was this one flight that was affected, and the court was discussing, like, the overall net effect of this, if it's allowed to stand, is going to affect the entire United States. And that's what's pretty much happening here. Uh, and it needs to get settled once and for all. You're at the federal uh, level, both Congress, they might, might not, or at the United States Supreme Court. You know what, let's do it. we we got to take a break here for the halfway through our, our show. But let's come back and talk about what we can do collectively to pull this information together, format it in such a way that our legislatures, which all are starting in January for the next session, can be one or five steps ahead of where they were last time. When we get back from our first one minute, first and last one minute break. Aloha, I'm Tim Apichaw, host for Moving Hawaii Forward, a show dedicated to transportation issues and traffic. We identify those areas where we do have problems in the state, but also the show is dedicated to trying to find solutions, not just detail our problems. So join me every other Tuesday on Moving Hawaii Forward. I'm Tim Apicella. Thank you. Aloha. My name is Raya Salter, and I am the host of Power Up Hawaii, which you can see live at from 1 to 1.30 every Tuesday at thinktechhawaii.com and then later on YouTube. I am an energy attorney, clean energy advocate, and community outreach specialist. And on Power Up Hawaii, we come together to talk about how can Hawaii walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. To do that, we talk to stakeholders all over the spectrum, from clean energy technology folks to community groups to to politicians, to regulators, to the utility. So please join us Tuesdays at 1 o'clock for Power Up Hawaii.
We are back for the second part of our show here. Ted Ralston in our downtown Honolulu studios of Think Tech Hawaii with our show Where the Drone Leads and a fascinating guest, a first timer on the show, uh, Jonathan Ruprecht, Ruprecht from uh, West Palm Beach, Florida, who runs uh, Jonathan Ruprecht Law and deals in all forms of aviation law, but now a lot in drone law. And uh, we welcome you on, John. Thanks for uh, spending the time late in the day on your end of the country. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay. And we were just in, in enjoying a, a incredible conversation you were leading us through just before the break about all the variation of rules and, and, and laws and, and inconsistencies and consistencies and the, the uh, uh, separation between federal, state, and local, or the lack of separation as it may be, and the difficulty people have seeing their way through this if they're a company or if they're an agency that wants to operate, or if they're a legislator who's trying to make rational decisions about bills presented to them. So collectively, we have six months between now and uh, December when the legislature, at least out here, kicks in. And we have some, uh, some, some time here, a little bit, a little bit of time. We got some significant mountains we got to climb in terms of putting information together. But if you were, if that was your job, what would, how, what would you suggest as a way forward to get, by December, a well understood, common sense view of, of, of what makes sense from, from a, a drone regulation perspective that legislature should care about to promote business, to promote education, promote workforce development, and better use of these systems in public safety and in law enforcement. Don't feel any pressure, but uh, <laughs> what do you think? Sure. Uh, in regards to, I guess, talking to the, the state legislators, that they need to ask the question, do they actually need to actually create some type of law uh, regarding drones? Because uh, there's kind of a discussion here where they're like, oh, we want to promote business. Well, creating laws really don't promote business. Uh, furthermore, it actually hinders a lot of the people that are actually honest. Because now we have to appease our conscience and actually look up the laws, which take how many of our hours of our time. Meanwhile, the illegals will run around doing whatever they want. And so uh, there needs to be a discussion there of, like, do we really need this? Is it really that much of a problem? Is this, you know, do we have any facts to support the alleged uh, incidents of drones doing X, Y, Z, you know? So kind of establish the facts and then nail, narrowly tailor the law in order to actually go to those facts. But start out at need, then I'd probably work back to, do you have the actual lawful authority to do that? And then narrowly tailor. Those are the three ways I would, I would do that. Because a lot of the states, I mean, they see uh, they see some problems. And I think there are some problems with people operating the drones uh, in, in a careless and reckless fashion. And they're like, they want to legitimately protect the, their citizenry from um, people doing stupid things. Uh, but is that really the state's jurisdiction at that point to start regulating the, the, um, the, the sky? Or is that primarily the FAA? And so, I mean, just because I, I, I see someone doing something uh, doesn't give me the justification to actually just go out and correct uh, wrongs wherever I see it. You know, we all have certain uh, jurisdictional, you know, we have jurisdictional boundaries that we need to stay inside of. And so it's kind of hard to say, uh, I'm going to tell you how to follow the law while I myself am actually violating the law and exceeding the authority granted to me, uh, right? Either under the with the states and the constitution or from under state state authority. And so, uh, be very careful that you are not uh, saying basically, as I say, you know, do as I say, not as I do, right? Yeah, that's a really good point. So start with what the real problems are, the problems that can't be solved by current. Uh, limits, laws, rules, or regulations, whatever they may be, and work from there. Because I, as you're saying that, I'm thinking of what our process is here. People generate bills and, and, and submit them. By the time a bill gets submitted, now you've got to deal with it. It's out there. So now all the testimony comes in, which is going to be ranging all over the place, and the confusion sets in on day one. If we could work backwards from what the real compelling problems are, even rank them from those that are really important problems to those that are more in the nuisance category, it might it might fo focus better on what the what the window of need really is. Right, and, and um, be, always question who's telling you something regarding the problems, right? At the end of the day, there's, there's not a lot of discussion regarding that. Like, I'm pro-business. I help out drone businesses. So I'm all like, hey, stop creating the regulations. 
flip side, people are like, hey, uh, we need to create some regulations. Law enforcement are like, we need something to do here. Well, interestingly, why are you suggesting that is so maybe you can actually be the head of said department that's going to then do all this, right? Because a knight needs a dragon to fight. Otherwise, no one's going to pay for his armor. Speaking of paying for armor, you got to get paid for this work you do. This is not billable 30 minutes to Think Tech Studios. I recognize that. But, but how, do you, uh, how do you actually promote your business or get clients and this sort of thing, speaking of the actual aspect of business? Uh, primary, a lot of it's word of mouth as well as just people just find my website and then contact me from there. Okay, so you're full-time occupied in, uh, I'm thinking of this from a workforce development perspective. There is a, wor there is a role for drone-specific but aeronautics-framed uh, thinking legal activity. Well, exactly. Uh, the, the FAA speaks aviationese, yeah. and people need to learn that. This is a Washington, D.C. Uh, type of industry. And then when you talk to the FAA, while they are normal human beings that live in America that speak English, uh, they speak aviationese, which has – each of those words has very specific meaning, and sometimes they have their own meaning. And so you'd read the same word and come to a – kind of different idea what it would mean, but they really mean something completely different. Great example is where uh, we had the Section 333 exemptions, and they said, hey, please explain to us how your exemption will benefit the public. And many people would reply, well, this benefits the public because we can now purchase this drone, and it's much cheaper than taking a helicopter and going out flying. <clears throat> FA does not care about economics. They care about safety. So when they say benefit, what they mean is benefit and only answer that in regards to how does it actually like increase safety, uh, you know, protecting the, the, the public. And so there's an aviation uh, translator need out there in the drone community. And that's probably what you provide a lot of, isn't it? You're explaining what the frame of reference is that the rules were created under and how then you fit your business need or your law enforcement need within that. Right. I mean, and, and then they're changing their policy uh, here and there and depending on what the, the case law and stuff uh, or the, the the laws and stuff coming out, it, stuff shifts around as time goes on. It's not stagnant. And then on top of that, people really didn't invest much time into actually studying out what drone law is, which further caused even more confusion because a lot of the stuff you see on the internet, I would say, is uh, it's uh, clickbait headlines at times that are written to get readers to read their articles but but real good takeaway from this whole this whole discussion here is whoever you are watching this ask the question why is this person saying this what are their motivations because there are a lot of people in the industry which have a lot of motivations that are inflaming uh, the situation hyper um, you know over embellishing the facts hyper inflating those or trying to deflate those so Ask the question, where, where's this person coming from? Why are they saying that? You know, I think we could take a really neutral stance at this at the university and, and think through from that, per, that perspective what the real problems might be and begin structuring a way to provide education, information, and the, the, the upside downside of various issues to our legislature between now and December and actually make things move forward much more smoothly next year. Uh, we are one of the FAA test ranges out here, which is, uh, adds to the complication because we're associated with Oregon and uh, Alaska, Mississippi, and Kansas in this lash-up. So that's yet as a whole another dimension that you won't find in, in certain states, and many of them. So we have the additional complication of that. But, the, the, you know, there's, there's so many aspects here. It would be interesting to have you on again and, and longer. We have issues of workforce development. We don't have enough trained workforce here. If the power company wants to hire one more drone pilot, they're going to have to go to California to get them because we don't have a, a machine that produces uh, certified and qualified. Not, not just certified, 107 is wonderful, but it doesn't qualify you for anything. It just means you passed a test. Really being qualified means you know what you're doing, and you can interact with the air environment in a really successful and positive way. We don't have that. And so where, we, where do we go? We go to California, we go to Texas, or something like that to get people. So uh, we really have a workforce issue here as well as, um, as, well as just getting the regulations all straightened out. So I'll take your, your lead on that. We've had Jim Williams on and uh, Charles Warren and some other guys recently, and there's a lot of ideas percolating here. The time is right for us to pull something together. Uh, Jim would like to take whatever we do and run it back through the, uh, the uh, Drone Advisory Committee and get them to, ex to sign off on it, so to speak, and maybe we can generate some kind of a national 
frame of thinking here that is useful for all as we go forward. And we'll count on you to critique it and help it and, and push it forward and, uh, and bring your great insight into the picture uh, as we go forward here. Sure, definitely. I'd, I'd, yeah, send it over and ask the question, why did that person say that? That's definitely a big takeaway from <laughs> this dealing with the drone industry, I can tell you. Ask that question. Okay, that's cool. Uh, that's a, the greatest summary out of this. So say that one more time for our wonderful audience here in terms of ask the question. Ask, ask yourself the question, why is that person saying that? So legislator, why did that legislator say that? Why did that person propose that information to the legislator? Police officer wanting to start a new program, doing that. Why did they do that? Uh, an attorney on a program, why did they say that, right? Ask those questions. What was their underlying motivation, and how does that motivation potentially influence the facts that they have presented? Okay, so we're backwards from the individual motivations, which are agendas, and the actual real problems, which may not connect, and come up with a realistic uh, uh, threat-based circumstance to, to work from. We'll do that. We'll take you on on that, Jonathan, and uh, look for you as a partner in this activity. Then you got to move your office out here to Hawaii. Uh, Make it all happen. Far away. I mean, I got, uh, <laughs> I'll have to get back to you on that. All right, you're very good. <laughs> hey, we'll get you on again sometime. Thanks so much, Jonathan, for joining us. Uh, Jonathan Rupert of Rupert's Law, uh, dealing with aviation in any form, but specifically on drones in West Palm Beach, Florida.